Lift every voice and sing. Lift, 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 lift every, every, every voice. Like I can't hear anything. Sing. Lift every voice and sing. To earth and heaven ring. And for as the eyes can see, harmonies and liberty. Let her rejoice and rise. High as the lift the skies. Where we speak, let it resound. No, it's not. The camera's not on. That the dark past has called us. Sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. Fishing the you really gonna have to stop using my computer. I can't even, like, what would I do to the sound? All I do is turn the computer up and down. Like, I don't know what song is called. Yet with a steady beat. Have no weary feet come to the place for which a father side. You talking about you don't know what to do, but every time I get it, more than we have come treading our path through the blood of the soul. Ordered out from the gloomy past to now we stand at last, where the white gleam of a bright star's cast. Lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing. 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 God of our weary years. God of our silent tears. Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who is by the might that led us into the light. Keep us forever in the pet. We pray, let our feet straight from the place of our God where we met thee. Let our hearts drunk of the wind of the world. We forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand. May we forever stand true to a God, true to our native land. Stone in the road we trod. Bit of the chastening rod felt in the days when hope and born had died. Yet with a steady beat. Have not a weary feet come to the place for which a father's side we have come over our way where the tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past to now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright stars cast. Lift every voice and sing. every voice and sing. All right. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and start us off. Welcome to the African African American Studies and Goma Conversation Series for this Black History Month lecture for 2022. I am Jennifer Padilla Wise. I'm co coordinator of the African and African American Studies here at Widener. I am very pleased to introduce my colleague and co coordinator of African African American Studies, Dr. Richard Cooper who will present his public lecture titled, Where Have All the Negroes Gone? Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Black Radical Tradition. Dr. Cooper earned his master's in social work practice at Howard University and earned his PhD in urban education at Temple University. His areas of research interest include culturally centered educational pedagogy, therapeutic methodological frameworks, healing, counseling agency-based practice and emancipation-oriented paradigms for African Americans and other disempowered, disempowered populations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Cooper. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wise. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance, as I usually do. I'm a little bit hyped, so I will try to take it down about three notches. That way, I shouldn't do any harm. Um, so I'm going to jump into this because I have um, probably like a seven hour presentation to do in 30 minutes, Dr. Wise. Is that the deal? <laughs> so um, 
we're going to get going. I did remember to hit the record button, which is a good sign. And let me see if I can load this PowerPoint really quickly here. Share screen. Boom shakalaka. All righty. And then to... All right, you should see, and Dr. Wise will let me know if you don't, you should see the first slide in Goma series, um, hmm, which I had fixed the typo on there. But anyway, make sure it's the right edition. It should read, uh, I just corrected that, it didn't save, um, African American uh, History Month. And it should, um, so you should be seeing that now. So um, let me just say uh, thanks, um, everybody, for coming out. We appreciate it. We started the Angoma series, um, not unlike in a small way what um, the late, great Dr. Carter G. Woodson um, did and attempted to do himself, which was to uplift, emancipate, liberate, educate um, the people. And it was a uh, tremendous enterprise, as I will be talking about. Um, in honor of um, uh, Black History Month, and as I say, Black 365 all this time, I think it's um, important to note, as I mentioned uh, in the Sidney Poitier lecture, and thanks for all of you that came out to that as well, just wanted to make sure that I added uh, the first... Um, first Black Studies Department was San Francisco State College, and it was founded by uh, Dr. Nathan Hare. I don't think I put his picture in there as well, and that is his phenomenal life partner and wife, Dr. Julia Hare. If you are not familiar with um, his work, their legacy, their work, it was um, phenomenal work, um, and I would urge you to begin to explore it just by looking up uh, his name uh, and her name. They were probably not even arguably, they were the dynamic duo of uh, the struggle in terms of academe. Um, and she passed not too long ago, I believe, but if my memory is correct, I hope I got that right, he is still with us. Um, let me give you a little something, something for the perspective today, and we're gonna draw upon um, Dr. Vincent Harding, a uh, quote of his from 1974. Uh, when black scholars hear the call to equal opportunity in darkness, they must remember that they do not belong in the darkness of an American culture that refuses to move towards the light. They are not meant to be blind captives and agents of institutions that deny light all over the world. No, they must speak the truth to themselves and to the community and to all who invite them into the new darkness. They must affirm the light, the light of movement, their past, the light movement of their people. They must affirm their capacities to move forward towards new alternative for light in America. And that's uh, Vincent Harding. He lists uh, four ways that black scholars can serve the community. One, uh, freeing their mind of all assumptions. Two, speaking the truth about the oppressor. Three, acting as a committed critic and participating fully in the building of a new worldwide black so society. Um, he exhorts black scholars to live the truth concerning the struggle as the best teaching of all and to put commitment to their people above even academic success. Um, the top quote, uh, then you will notice, um, he indicates that transformation begins with the fierce determination of the people to transform their reality. Only when the aspirations of the people well up in a mighty surge will the times begin to change for the better. So that would be the pretext in uh, somewhat of the backdrop for the presentation uh, today. And we, we want to give you just a sim simple, quick kind of a gaze of uh, black life and what we deal with today. Uh, as I have indicated top left, I'm black uh, 24-7, 365, you know, 24 hours of the day. And so while we will in a minute get into the social construction of um, Negro he History Week and Black History Month vis-a-vis -vis Carter G. Woodson, um, the, the, the tenant that I espouse and articulate and try to live by is that I'm black 24-7, uh, 365. But the struggle does continue. We look to the left as we briefly pay 
unfortunate but yet homage to uh, Amir Locke as we as, are saying that we as black people uh, live in a society that continues to kill black men and women to eliminate us and although we attempt to in a celebratory fashion um, extol the virtues and the legacy of our people through the strident efforts um, towards the cause of liberation um, we still um, unfortunately as we attempt to celebrate if that's what we're going to do today we still must mourn the atrocities as you see in the bottom left that um, are part of the social construction of black life both in the world and I would argue in America. In the middle we know of the tremendous assault uh, on voting right, rights um, as we speak and we are still attempting to move forward uh, with the legacy of not only the late J great John Lewis, Lewis but of others who attempted to just do the very simple thing for black people in America, construct equal rights <laughs> for us. Um, while uh, critical race theory is attacked under the notion of if it upsets us, if the truth upsets us, we don't want to know it. Um, I would argue that that's a consistent pattern that we have seen um, in American life and in American uh, history um, due in large part to uh, the continuation of white supremacy. And at the right, even if we socially deconstruct that we don't have time to do, uh, the legacy of the Super Bowl uh, vis-a-vis -vis the hip-hop um, four-way that was presented, there are deeper social political issues that we could raise as to whether, uh, while a fantastic performance on the aesthetic level, while in fact maybe some folks should have protested in uh, more than one person uh, should have taken a knee, and maybe they should have snuck in, in my humble appear, uh, opinion, Cullen Kaepernick. That, that would have been the crescendo as far as I'm concerned. But we don't have time to get into all of that. I think I've eaten up five minutes already. Um, so when, when you talk to just everyday um, black folks as Woodson did, um, you find yourself in 2021, 2022, and the recent past, you find black folks asking a key question with somewhat of a slight edge and tone. If you're black, you know what I'm talking about. You know, why do we still need black history, she said. Um, why, why, why don't we still need black history, some would argue. And, you know, in, in, in common speak, we see um, the folks that, you know, somehow have been taught that because it's the shortest uh, month of the year, February, that it has been relegated to this notion of lesser. And that was never really Woodson's intention. And somehow um, I hope to illuminate a little bit that that is um, a critical misnomer, but we will get to that. Um, one of the things I will say later is that uh, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson did not want it to be rele relegated to celebratory um, portrait histories of black folks. That is not what he intended. We will get to that later. There are many reasons, arguably, why we still should celebrate Black History Month. There are reasons why we shouldn't, and you will get as a final argument from me why we need a reboot. Um, just to share with you a little bit about my thinking and meta thinking about the presentation and what shaped and informed um, it, um, I have been, as many of us have been, um, following the work of Dr. Malefi Asante for about 30 years. It's one of the reasons why I moved to Philadelphia uh, from Washington, D.C., um, where I received my uh, master's degree from, as I like to say, the Howard University. Um, but I was fortunate enough to attend and be invited to um, several celebrations for Dr. Asante in the department, and um, one of which um, was uh, led in part by a lecture by a phenomenal scholar, if you're not familiar with her work, uh, Dr. Pat Reed Merritt, a phenomenal scholar and, and a social worker and cultural historian, um, dance dance artist. She, she's a triple threat. Um, but the work, uh, the, the delivery of a speech that she gave that was written up later on in the Journal of Black Studies really kind of shaped my thinking in part for, the, for today. And she did this amazing piece of how to assess the Asante effect on human life, the Afrocentric approach, um, part ethnographic, part qualitative, part quantitative. Um, if you've ever seen Dr. Pat Reed Merrick lecture, uh, she is 
absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal author and writer. But it informed and shaped my thinking about how amongst the common people, if there was no Asante with his Afrocentric idea and how it rippled over the last 30, 35 years and has reached the masses of people, even in common speak, um, you, you will see that there was a very similar phenomena um, with Carter G. Woodson. His work has rippled through the scholars, to the people, through the high schools, and cascades in part, in part, um, vis-a-vis Black History Month. But let me speed this up. Um, I picked a title. Um, some people wouldn't reduce my, uh, reproduce my title. I know that. I, I'm, I'm feeling some kind of way about that kind of affectionately. Some people were afraid to reproduce the title. So let me say it for you again. Um, where have all of the Negroes gone? That's the question. Where have all the Negroes gone? <clears throat> in my lifetime, I was born in 1958. In my, in my lifetime, we called ourselves colored and Negro. We, black people, called ourselves Nubian, nope, colored and Negro. Those were the terms. That's how we saw ourselves. It was not pejorative in a sense, um, but in another sense it was. Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the black radical tradition. I and other scholars, and really they did all the work, I'm just bringing it to you. You, you, you have to place his work in the legacy of the black radical tradition, and in a minute I'll tell you why. But look at the images. Um, Rembrandt, uh, 1600 to the right, those, that's a depiction of, I think it's accurately called the two Moors, but in contemporary times it has been called the two um, African men and the two Negroes, but I believe it was originally called the, 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 two, um, the two Moors, uh, meaning people of a darker skin. Now, in, in, I would call it in 2022 the two brothers. That's the way I would approach it. But it shows that even in 1600, much of what we know about ourselves has been constructed through the lens of Spain, Europe, the Dutch, and elsewhere. And inherently in that is the problem. Bottom left, I didn't know that there was a Negro mountain in the greater Pittsburgh, upper Pens uh, Pennsylvania region, and it's just too long of a story for me to talk about. But this framing of the word Negro um, and, and this sensibility of what we once called ourselves is part of the reason and the rationale for Black History Month today. Let me pick it up a little bit. Um, Woodson, in, in, he, he fought and he lived for what he called the cause and the cause was to uplift to educate the world um, about the negro about negro history and and he did it many many ways publishing houses and educating people and, and writing 27 or so books many 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 is, um, essays he sought to correct to fix, to ameliorate, to repair um, the, the racist slights uh, institutionalized against black people. And, and was utterly steadfast in his work. He was an honorary member of Omega Sci-Fi. Look, I'm not a Q. Um, I'm not a Q, uh, I'm not a Kappa, Kappa, I'm not a member of the Divine Nine. But you have to place him as an honorary member because one of the earliest versions of his speech, speeches about the need to do this, was given to the Omegas, and the Omegas ran with it. They started attempting to get the word out and to honor um, some of his ideas through their construction in support of Woodson of a Negro uh, History Week that he later said, you know what, my association needs to take this on and do it more fully. But you have to see him as a uh, Q. I'm sure there's some cues if they're on this uh, on the Zoom. They're uh, they're doing the Omega sign right now. Black History Month. The traditional narrative that we know is that it was created in 1926 in the United States by Woodson, his Association of the Study of Negro Life. Um, so much I've read about this. Don't have time to go into it. A phenomenal enterprise, and what he built. 
um, to educate our people in the world, to provide opportunities to then Negro uh, professors and black scholars, um, high school teachers, is noteworthy in and of itself. He was born in 1809. His parents had been enslaved and he was seeking to um, uplift and to cor correct the misnomers about uh, Negroes didn't do anything. Colored people had no history. They didn't do anything. And the depictions, as we all know too well, were of um, blacks in servitude and, and, and blacks looking foolish and sheepish. So he pretty much was um, a one man army and he built institutions and rallied people around it. And there were many others doing similar work at the time. What shapes my title and my gaze for this work is um, Black Marxism, uh, the making of the Black radical tradition. It is a beautifully dense work by the late great Dr. Cedric Robinson that I read in the 80s. Now listen, if there's some students on this call or some former students of mine, when I read um, Black Marxism in I think the 80s, and I have an old school version of it, it was over my head. About 60% of it was over my head. I have reread it, and he was he was on to something. So the edition I own is the 83 edition. It has since then been republished um, in, what, 2000, 2001. And I'm going to make reference to some of what Robin Kelly said in the foreword. Um, Cedric Robinson was an African-American professor and not unlike um, black professors, uh, you know, I'm, I'm odd somewhat in that way. Black professors either chose to move or had to move or moved around quite, quite a bit, which wasn't um, too unusual at the time. Let me speed this up a little bit. So let me just take you through the gaze a little bit by using... Um, uh, Robin Cowley's uh, comments in the forward of the new edition because it will shape then the conversation in the gaze and the way that I look at um, the work and the need for uh, Black History Month. Per perhaps more than any other book, Black Marxism shifts the center of radical thought and revolution from Europe to the so-called periphery to the colonial territories, marginalized colored people of the metropolitan centers of capital, and those Franz Fanon identified as the wretched of the earth. So this is this is um, this is Robinson, who's who he 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 grounds the work initially in Europe but he is exploring the plight of oppressed black people. And it makes a pervasive cause that the radical thought and practice which emerged in these sites of colonial and racial capitalist exploitation were produced by uh, cultural logics and epistemologies of the oppressed as well as the specific racial and cultural forms of domination. He essentially is saying translated that black people are agents of the change that they are just not those that had something impacted on them, uh, their depression, their oppression. Thus, Robinson not only decenters Marx's history and historiography, but also what one might call the eye of the storm. The book is, after all, a critique of Western Marxism and its failure to understand the conditions and, and movements of black people in Africa and the diaspora. Robin. Robinson not only exposes the limits of historical materialism as a way of understanding black experience, but also reveals that the roots of Western racism took hold in European civilization well before the dawn of capitalism through the social construction of the other, the dark other, AKA the Negro. Thus several years before the, the recent explosion in whiteness studies, Robinson proposed the idea that the uh, racialization of the proletariat and the intention of whiteness began within Europe itself long before Europe's modern encounter with Africa and new world labor. Such insights give the dark ages new meaning. Now this is Kelly's forward in 2000. It's just hard for me to believe that this is 22 years old. Um, we're going back and taking a quick gaze at who were the Moors. Moors were, were believed to be many things, and sometimes the definition of the word Moors um, is confusing. It, confusing. It could mean 
um, you know, uh, a, a darker skinned uh, people of um, Muslim, as in Muslims in Spain or Europeans of African descent. It's derived from the Latin word uh, Maris. The term was used to describe Berbers and other people from the ancient Roman uh, providence. Um, it generally meant people of a darker skin in the 17th century, uh, meaning the 1600s. African men, then known as Moors, were rarely depicted. And when we go back to Rembrandt, that I don't have time to talk about, it was a surprise that he would depict um, um, black men in the way that he did, because he tended to, f uh, to focus on um, aristocrats and or biblical figures. And uh, not enough time to talk about all this. Um, let me just move to the heart of this point before I get a note that I'm out of time. Um, so Robinson's work is seminal um, because he grounds the work in the experiences of African people. And he, he moves away from um, the Marxist notion and ideas of uh, the proletariat in a way that um, doesn't consider the plights of black people and or their contributions to their own emancipation. I'll say that in short, because I got some other stuff to do. Um, I think what's key to note in this, and this is the wrong way to do a slide, which I get, but I just want to make a point or two about it. And some of this stuff, uh, folks, when you're sitting and reading this stuff, um, that's the fun thing about being an academic. You get to sit and read and think about it and say, oh my gosh, how did he, how did he come up with this you know, in 1983 and prior to that in terms of his life work. So let me just read a little bit of the quote and then keep it going. Um, so the, the, the African experience of liberation is not a variant of, of Western radicalism whose proponents happen to be black. Rather, it is a specifically African response to an oppress oppression emergent from the immediate determinants of European development in the modern era and formed by orders of exploitation woven into intersees of European social life from the inception of Western civilization. The similarity of African survivals in the New World. That's the United States, people. 1619, original um, indentured, then enslaved Africans. Africans brought to America. Not slaves, but enslaves. Okay, critical point. Uh, the similarity of African survivals in the New World points not to tribal peculiarities, but to the essential oneness of African culture. Frankie Beverly said, we are one, if, you, if you're a lover of music. The culture was the shield which frustrated Europeans to dehumanize de -hu through servitude. So it's the organic components of the, what would be called the hybrid African culture. Uh, the slave may have appeared in a profit and loss account as an item and a thing and a piece of property, but he faced his new situation as an African. We call that agency, will, um, a worker and a man. At this level uh, or perception, it is quite irre irrelevant to inquire which tribe um, he or she originated from. And so when you look at that, um, for us to call ourselves Negro, uh, I'm bringing it back to the title, people, as best I can in the few minutes I have left. For us to call ourselves Negro is not only wrong, it's, 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 it's a remnant of our oppression. And so in putting that back in the title, it shows you, if not overtly, but subliminally, subliminally from where we have come. Um, and so what Woodson did likely as the father, and there were some mothers in there too, and, and some other folks, is that he and others um, brought about the reshaping and the understanding of ourselves that would come later in subsequent works, AKA uh, Malefi Asante, Dr. Malefi Asante and others. Um, and then uh, the bottom quote is by Dr. Benjamin Mays of uh, Morehouse uh, from back in the day. How else can we explain Carter T. Woodson uh, coming out of the coal mines of West Virginia, studying at Berea College until the day law 
introduced segregation in Kentucky. Then he went on to University of Chicago, earned a master's, and from there he went to Harvard, earning a PhD. Um, he was a dean at Har Howard uh, for a minute where he got fired. Oh, gosh, is that a funny story? He got fired from Howard because he wouldn't, he didn't want to um, usher um, or be a part of um, making um, colored students go to church, essentially. I mean, that's the shortest possible explanation. And he and the then president wrote terse letters back and forth. Um, Woodson did many things, but he formalized a black learning aesthetic when he founded Negro History Week. It explicitly tied cu curricular content to black dreams of freedom like never before. That in itself, people, is a radical act. Extending from Woodson's larger pedagogical vision, uh, the week diffused counter hegemonic ideas about black life and culture into school communities. Woodson was renowned at writing for and talking to the common people and scholars, but he spoke eloquently to the common people from whence he came. Some people would later criticize Woodson for that very thing, um, being able to speak to the common man and the common woman. Um, this is a, um, a, a, a shot of a uh, book in the Widener y Library that hasn't, hadn't been taken out for 20 some years until I took it out the other day. And this book um, teaches a more uh, interesting and adequate uh, history of Woodson. Let me take a couple points. How much time do I have left? Let me make a couple other key points because I'm probably... I'm probably cruising in terms of running out of time. How much time do I have before we do Q&A? You have about eight minutes. We'll give them 10 do minutes. It. Yeah, good. I did shorten it because I had about 40 more minutes worth. Yay. Okay, good. I did shorten it. All right, let me make a, let me make a, couple, let me make a couple of short points here. Um, and then we can do a uh, question and answer. Um, to get back to the initial question by just the everyday African-American person, why do we have this? You know, why don't we? We don't need this. Like, what is this thing? Um, Woodson, with a team of others that he developed, um, went to high schools, uh, taught other scholars to take his work, started celebrating Negro History Week um, from an idea that this needed to be done, um, what he called the cause to uplift the people. He started these celebrations, many of which were had on uh, out of his offices in 9th Street in Washington, D.C. And they continued over time to go to his biggest successes early on were getting the word spread to um, black high schools across the country. When you read the many articles that I did of this massive, this massive effort alone, to uplift what he referred to as the call. Never married, you know, I don't know what he did on the side, but he never married, um, died of a stroke, had his 9th Street offices in, um, in DC. Um, he fought for this. He also created vehicles for then, um, the only ones that existed or the primary ones that existed for black scholars to get their work out, which as we all know in the discipline would um, provide the mechanism and the vehicles for what would later become black studies. And, and so it's when you look at the tentacles of, and the ripples, I should say, of what he did in his lifetime, dying, I believe, of a heart attack or a stroke um, in 1950, if my memory is correct, the ripples of his work are still manifested even to this day and the legacy of the scholarship and many of the movements that we see, uh, many of which are cited by Asante. So let me make um, let me make a couple uh, points. I'm arguing for a reboot of Black history. I am arguing that what Black history has been relegated to is this cast of the same four or five characters. With all due respect, because I'm not knocking um, Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman or uh, the ancestors. That's that's not who I am. But it has been relegated to this piecemeal, little bit of this and that, you know, sing and dance, play some music, and it doesn't look at the deeper structural issues. Woodson wanted to look at 
the work that had been done over the year in regards to the cause and to continue the, to define what other work needs to be done. He argued against in his time the grand celebratory work that we see today and he even, which is hard to believe, argued against and I think largely because of his time, um, political aspects of the work. You can understand why he did that in the 1940s, 30s, and 20s because he understood if, if black people in some arenas um, did that kind of public work connected to Negro History Week, it would have been um, attacked and maligned. And he, I, I think he took a political stance in he wanted to plant the seeds of this and to move it forward. He also saw it as a vehicle. You, you got to go back to Woods. Remember, 1865, so-called, you know, freedom of the slaves. And I'll stop here um, for questions. But he understood that the masses of people needed to be educated. And he gave them vehicles to chronologue and to write about their own history, largely in then black newspapers. And I have much more that I could say. So I'm arguing for a reboot. I'm arguing if the common man and woman, black, um, um, don't understand the greater um, significance of black history and um, believe that it has been relegated to some singing and, and some songs and four or five people, we are missing the mark. But certainly, if Woodson and others can construct successfully from nothing, like soul food, will you take the leftovers and you build it into a delicacy. Um, you take um, scatting and rhythms and, and guttural cries and moans as Cornel West talks about and you turn it into a culture. You take two turntables and a microphone where they ain't teaching music in your schools anymore. They ain't teaching instruments. They ain't giving you resources. So you take two turntables and a microphone and you turn that into an art form the same way you did um, in American culture where you have been given nothing. But as Cedric uh, Robinson points out, our will and the ability to have social agency and to create has been second, in my opinion, uh, to none. And we can take this thing and reboot it and fashion it into what it needs to be today. I will pause there because I could go on for another two hours with things that I meant to talk about in the piece that I cut out of the PowerPoint just to be succinct. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. Um, so we're going to go ahead and leave this time for question and answers or comments and maybe get some dialogue going about this topic. Uh, so does anyone have any, you know, would anyone like to raise their hand or you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment. You could also ask in the chat. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Cooper. Uh, appreciate being invited to the to the uh, Sydney Portier Zoom as well. Just a couple of things. Wanted to say that you're in great company in terms of following with um, Dr. Melissa Sante and uh, Professor Merritt. As you know, Dr. King, part of his uh, meta thinking, as you said, came about when he heard Dr. Benjamin Mays come back from India and listen to Gandhi and so forth. So. And I can say this similar to my experiences with, with teaching. Um, a couple of things. One, in terms of the Marxist piece, going back there, that the Black Panthers in, in their beginning did a lot to um, engender uh, agency. And even as this year's theme through Osala is Black health and wellness, just having the foresight to know that nutrition and breakfast was important to the, the learning capacity of, of children in general. Um, I think Jose Cejulia said that uh, I've never seen anyone who, you know, if they're on the earth, that they don't have the capacity to learn. And so could you say a little bit more about um, Black Panthers in the journey towards the decolonizing uh, um, what we thought of ourselves as Negro or, or, or colored? And secondly, with regards to pre-service teaching, uh, you know, 
going to, if you're going into teaching, your first year, you you say you have to take the, the special year learning support, all the ADA stuff, you know, the autism. You have to take that. But we know, given the climate in, in today's with CRT and banning books and censorship, that that should be mandatory as well to to uh, take those classes as teachers step out of college into their first year of teaching. So Marxism and the whole pre-service piece, if you could. Yeah, you sound like you'd be a great speaker for the Angoma series. Holler at your boy. I'm a, we're going to get together on that one on, on a sidebar conversation. Um, yeah, uh, uh, first, so I had the privilege. Um, so I did a radio show for about 11 years in Philly on WURD on black culture and black life. I interviewed, um, I must have done 20 or 30 interviews with um, uh, former members and authors who wrote about the Black Panther Party. And that could be a, um, a five-year course in and of itself what they did we shouldn't allow people to frame yeah. our own people's life's work as radical it was emancipatory it was liberating it was social work it was education it was protection it was aesthetics it was um so we can't allow someone else's gaze to define the genius of what they were doing and the the common sense of having a platform um you know, much of which we see in um, in the ethos of the black social workers and others, the black psychologists and others who were of that generation 60s and 70s where they either had direct connections to um, members of the Black Panther parties because of the extensive development of the chapters throughout the country and throughout the world. So their, um, their advancement, and, and that's such a great point, uh, Brother Eric, it's just a phenomenal point. Their advancement in many ways of what I would argue are the common sense um, practices that needed to take place of and for and about uh, oppressed people. And, and you said it more eloquently than I could. You know, just like a head start kind of a vibe. Feed them, start them early, take care of them, um, provide them safety. Um, and so, and give me the second part of your question. Uh, what was the second part of your question? There was a second part to it that I wanted to address. Give me part two again, refresh my memory. Because I could talk about the Black Panther Party for, for, for days. Uh, yes. Go ahead, unmute. Regarding uh, pre-service teaching and oh oh Woodson, I got you. Um, my PhD is in urban education. Um, wait a minute, no one can take back my degree, right? I guess not. I've had it for twenty some years now. I had to make sure real quick. Um, I have a PhD. I have a PhD piled high and deep in urban education. As I said in my other presentation, I took it because I thought we'd do some study of black people. There got to be some study. You're in urban education for God's sake. It has to be a study. What Woodson did in pedagogy, curriculum, teaching, methodology, design, instruction was brilliant. Was his name ever uttered once in any um, policy or curricular course that I took at the Temple University um, in urban education? Hell no. Oh, that was on tape. No. And it is an embarrassment. Um, um, and, and my attempt to even pay homage to and to acknowledge Woodson, uh, Carter Godson Woodson today is a mere sliver in a mere slice of his social agency, his creative genius, his teaching acumen. Some have argued that because he came from labor and coal miners, that he knew how to speak to them, how to teach them, and how to uplift. You know, I want to make the brother a social worker as well, but he he, he doesn't claim that he was. So I, I thank you so much for pointing that out. Dr. Cooper, we got a question in the chat. Um, it says, as we look to further educate Black and all people concerning our true history and, I'm sorry, our true history and, sorry, it's like, it's hard to, true history, um, Black history and programs and CRT, oh wait, I'm so sorry, the, the, the scrolling function is. <laughs> I can read it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, go yeah. ahead. Dr. Cooper, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about as we see this assault on Black history programs and CRT, and we're trying to get out the truth of our stories, what role do you see technology playing in disseminating um, 
you know, our information about our history, particularly as it relates to our youth? And is that a barrier or um, a benefit? No, I mean, um, so I, I've had the, um, I, I've been teaching off and on for, I don't know, seven, eight years, um, a, a version of, of course, African Americans in contemporary society. And I've had a lot of support, let me say, uh, in my department in social work, just tremendous. You know, I wouldn't be here had it not been, you know, for my department, uh, my home department, which is social work. And I've, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Jen Wise. He's now two years, three days, and few seconds. But I say, um, so when you go back to the Black Lives Matter movement, that started how people, sister said to another sister on technology, Black Lives Matter. And it, it, it was this spark to the whole um, uh, continuity of the movement that we've seen now for, you know, X, Y, Z years. I, I don't want to say culminating because we could argue that point, We'll say that there was a more recent crescendo of two years ago where the masses, you know, or where the populace, you know, white, black, you know, brown, although, you know, black and brown been in it for a minute, um, where it kind of crescendoed, you know, across the world. So technology, to answer your question more directly, when used appropriately, it's kind of like the drum. You know, folks don't want us to use it in a certain way. They didn't want us to gather and, and circle in the woods, you know, from the plantation and sing our songs and to recreate our culture. So when you use it in the best possible way, it can be a benefit. I talk to young people. My struggle today, a lot of times in teaching young people in, in my current class, is how can we get people to pay attention to the more important things because there was so much uh, distractions um, out there, you know, in the world. And even when I, I, I'll say this thing real, really fast, I gave a Super Bowl assignment where, I, you know, I'm trying to get young people to socially deconstruct things and to think more. I won't even say radically. I'll just say in a way that's non-Western or Eurocentric. And the fun of it has been pushing them to then rethink and to re if you remove the aesthetics of the Super Bowl, which was brilliant if you love hip hop, but you still have to raise the social political questions that are deeper. Should they have performed? Should they have protest? It's not so much about who took a knee and who didn't take a knee. Should you, should you have even been there in the first place? Or when you have access to that kind of space, what do you do with it? And that has always been the struggle for black uh, 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 black people, no matter what role we're in, there's a dual identity, as, as, as the boys pointed it out. So hopefully I answered your question. I could probably go on for days, but I'll pause there. Yeah, Dr. Kuba. Yeah, uh, my name is Bambala. Uh, I'm one of Dr. Kuba's uh, students uh, for more than 20, uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, Wagner, MSW. But you struck a point regarding rebooting of our history. One thing that has been conspicuously absent from the Black movement in the United States has been what has happened from the motherland. Mainstream media has said, hey, the motherland, they've, they've succeeded in cannibalizing the motherland. Everything from Africa is being construed as negative. We need to rewrite that history. If we don't rewrite the history, there is always a divide. I'm I'm a African immigrant in this country, but you my brother, you my sister, you are African American. What they've done cleverly is that they can consider themselves as Italians. They can consider themselves as Greek. They consider themselves as, as Irish. But they blanket all of us, the 39, 36, 39 million of us in this country, as African Americans. Africa has a population of 1.2, 1.4 billion. We are not from the same part of Africa. I'm from Liberia. You could be from Tanzania. But we are Africans. But they have succeeded in blanketing us into one. And they put us in this little group. And then we are not, as a people, especially as social workers, as uh, people who are involved in the African uh, residents and the recipe, into believing that Africa is negative. 
And I've worked in the school districts across the country on the East Coast, in Montana, and now in Minnesota for the last 20 plus years. I see that our children are getting far away from where we should be redirecting them. I'd just like for you to talk a little bit on what's happening. Yeah, um, I mean, you're, you, you, you said it very well. It's always a pleasure seeing you, Brother Pangbala, as well. And it's good to see you, and it's good to see that you are uh, you and your family are well. And congratulations on your recent marriage, by the way. I wanted to say that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Woodson called it the cause. You know, what I say to my students is that there has been a consistent, is consistent. Dr. Asante would say the same thing. Pat Reed married the same thing. We have seen a consistency or constancy of oppression directed towards black people. Uh, Cedric Robinson pointed out in, in his book, other uh, men and women have done the same. It is a consistent um, hatred. When you look at the core in um, what I would call European studies, sociology, anthropology, social work, when you look at the beginning of it, it's negative and hostile um, racist depictions of black people. Like that, that's, you know, and, 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 and so we have to continue to do the same um, corrective work with the advantage, I would argue, in these days and times that we have more uh, resources, books, um, I've been to workshops where the scholars talked about how they had to write the books, how there were a generation of scholars in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and I would argue in our disciplines, we still don't teach or get the opportunity to, to teach this stuff because we act as if Freud and Maslow and Mnuchin and those dead white men, my bad, those uh, those dead fathers of knowledge um, were the be all end all. And so we have to in since I'm in a university setting, we have to 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 push to be a part of the conversation and not relegated to, you know, just the margins. And arguably, of course, that's what we would be attempting to do in the African American studies minor. But because at Widener universities and other universities like Widener, they are um, they are re envisioning what I would call white liberal studies, that there would be an opportunity to let me just use the new hip language to uh, is it decolonize? Is that the new language? <laughs> you know, uh, to decolonize. Um, uh, the, the, the curriculum, the pedagogy, the the, the information um, from a traditional Eurocentric viewpoint. We have to keep doing the work. That's the short. If if Woodson can do what he did and many others, that legacy. We we can't use a trite phrase of standing on the shoulders of the ancestors. You're literally on the blood, the sweat, the tears, the desires of the ancestors. And by the way, as I pointed out in the top of the presentation, we're still being killed. We're being we're still being killed systematically. We're still being killed by police. We're still being uh, killed by underemployment. We're st so on and on and on. We're still being killed by public policy. And yet we see in the in the far right or in the far universe, there are folks who just don't even want to hear the history that is consistent with what we have seen in America. I will pause there because I can I can go on for I see, I see we have a hand up. I, I did just want to say, I know that some folks may have to go because we um, are to end at 1250. So if you have to go, that's fine. Um, but we have one hand up, I see. So we'll go ahead and take uh, Tangela's question and then we'll wrap up after that. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Jennifer. Hi, Dr. Cooper. You know, I was going to come with a question. <laughs> oh, come hard. Come hard, Tangela. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, so I think my question is just thinking about the Black community um, at that sort of, I guess, meso level. Um, how do we change the paradigm of Black history not being a set? right or focused on at one particular time and that it becomes a part of American history because that is what it is right so it sort of harkens back to what you're saying I'm black 365 days of the year right and so I sort of give February the month for others to publicly um, acknowledge our contributions but then the other 11 months I'm doing the work, we're all doing the work. I'm still, you know, living in my blackness. 
Yeah. Um, so there's been a movement over the last. So when I lived in D.C. in in the uh, in the 80s, um, there were um, as the person that answered the Black Panther question. I mean, some of which you have to um, teach your own or provide the information for your own children, your own resources. Um, other ethnic cultural groups have do it, do do it successful. Um, the the identity of our we can't leave the identity development of our children relegated to the mainstream. We we already know through so many studies um, about you know the complexion, the shape of our nose. The, you know I could repeat all this stuff that most of us know, but if we're using Woodson as the lens, we have to do something about it. Um, it is easier to change something like Black History Month than it was to create it. It has already been birthed in the world. Now let's just collectively reboot it. And what better place to have a conversation in a Black History Month presentation to look at more critically what it is, but not from the perspective of, oh, we can't do anything about it. It's the coldest month of the year. You know, like, black. of course we can. We can do anything we want to do. And and so we have to be, as we say in social work, we have to be empowered enough and use a strength based perspective to simply get it done. I will pause there. Hopefully I answered your question. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for your presentation. Very much appreciate it. And yeah. Oh, I just want to say any um, my intention is to uplift the scholars and the people. And when you sit and read all this stuff, oh, my God, it's beyond enlightening. It's 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 hypening. And so, um, you know, I am hopeful that if nothing else, that it will encourage people to find and to read um, about Woodson. I have saved many articles and you know, video presentations and stuff that I didn't get to, but hopefully the genesis of what I've said, literally from the souls of other scholars who wrote this stuff, who brought forward the ideas, at the minimum, it, hopefully it'll provide a segue for you to begin to do some of your own work. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. was a quick 30 minutes, Dr. Wise. Let me stop the recording. That was quick. Stop recording now. How do I do that? Uh...